I'm Sandy Hutchison. Uh, in the very early days of the library, um, when I came returned to Scotland from Canada, uh, went into the Scottish Poetry Library in the World's End close, and Tessa said that, uh, showed me later in the journal that she kept every day, an interesting man came in today from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there were, co there were consequences to that, and uh, one of them's actually standing <laughs> on, alongside of me. Max is, uh, uh, I married Tessa's eldest daughter, and Max is the first grandson. This first, this poem I'm reading is called Mornings at Inch, and it's a, it's a tribute to a friend, a uh, close friend, and uh, an affirmation. Mornings at Inch. You pause at the door you have opened to taste the morning. Sky for clouds, trees for wind, grass for dew. As you clear away ashes, fetch logs. You return and kneel at the fire, still barefooted and in your russet pajamas. You kneel in a kind of prayer while working to create a flame. It is normal, surely, and natural, that this is the ritual you have made familiarly exceptional, just what you have always done. Another day is offered the moment you open morning's door, it rushes to every sense and asks for response. Yes, the word of flame. shortest day. Swans are flying and catch the sun. Great white wings, noisy with love. Gallic is singing and catches the heart. In yellow van, as if a voice for the silent swan, bearing music through generations of isolation and exile and war. Kayleys, communities, new and old. What am I but another bearer? A swan, a voice with McAllister chords. Born in the Asian dust, an ambassador hidden in Scotland. From here, from nowhere, to wherever the world. Words, works, bonded. of picking up her book yesterday <laughs> and opening it up to several Irish couplets. And for some daft reason, I started to read it, and hence I'm here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so please be patient with me. <laughs> to several Irish couplets. A hair went by on the road in Kerry. Lippity loppity, not in a hurry. Smart new homes with picture windows, television and soft potatoes. Farms grow vegetables and horses, or rather sell their fields for houses. The old red box, the climber's rest, Lord Brandon's cottage, a swallow's nest. Kate Carney's cottage, ponies and carts, saddles parked on bonnets of cars. Climb to the cairn of the Celtic saint, St. Finian, with his faithful hound. Folk leave coins in penance for sinning, Others uplift them and go on for drinking. Pass a martyr's cross, 1923. Roadside murder sets Ireland free. Donoghue and O'Sullivan, Fianna McCool and Gary Owen. Fuchsia tangled with honeysuckle, midges trapped in butterwort petal. Old Coach Road, the path to mast. 
old railway turned to mud and moss. The Cecil Oak and Hollywoods, Glen of the Birches, the Arbutus, tiny black winged butterflies in ferny shadow of the trees. Mist and rain and swirl and sway, mixed, mixing forty shades of grey. Fox creeps in over Dingle Point, McGillicuddy Ricks grow faint. The priests, the puddles and the famine, a cause for every occasion. The need for jokes, the dismal wet, reels and jigs and step dance feet. Glass design like jellyfish, nature captured in a dish. A home you love, a life you hate, maybe have to emigrate. Then write to fictionalize the fact Ireland will remain intact. Dark the water, dark the rock, dark the bog and the mountain lock. Black turf ditch on the Fenian's hill, sundew, orchid, asphodel. Through Dunlow Gap a pilgrim's progress, the veil of shadow and water roses. A patch of green where sheep are white, a patch of blue sky and sunlight. Sheep on stone wall eating berries, waterfall that protects the fairies. Oshian floats on a milk white steed, but the girk must break before he's freed. Mysterious then a conaghy, rock faces marked for fertility. Patrick Casey's Ken Grinsine leaps with dolphins off Carrasidine. Between the devil and the deep blue sea, monks of Skellig's monastery perched like birds in stone colonies, building their cells and rock staircases. Climb the precipice, don't look down, pray the poppins and pantheon. <laughs>
whose very existence depended on my work, however exhausted I was, drained and hungry. For I had a trice to eat with Scottish poetry, and I'd compare myself to my seafaring ancestor who sailed to Australia in a Clyde Paddle steamer. If he overcame the dangerous currents and oceans, attacks by pirates and running out of fuel, I could surely sail on with minimum funds when I had a chart, a vision, and a goal with a volunteer crew of experts, friends, and faithful navigators. Like ancient Celtic adventurers, we set afloat a curve of poetry practitioners. Such risk in action brings its accompaniment and gathers its own momentum and impetus. To wait and see or slump in bewilderment will never achieve our destiny, our bliss. To make our own decisions and choose our course, we'll see us voyage ahead on a life of adventure and find our way to what next desirable harbour. This uh, final poem, which appealed to me, um, this has got the this is the um, the Protestant Reformation voice is in this poem, and it's uh, it's called "Let It Not Be Said," um, and there's a prefix explanation uh, from a Dr. Andrew Thompson, seventeen. Minister of St. George's, Edinburgh, a passionate philanthropist who advocated in 1830 the immediate abolition of slavery, regardless of costs. And the quote is, let it not be said that I am indifferent to the consequences of immediate emancipation. I am indeed indifferent to them. I despise them wholly as put into competition with the demands which are made by outraged humanity for justice. Tessa says, let it not be said that I am indifferent to the slavery abolished two centuries ago or the pleas made then by impassioned Scots such as Andrew Thompson, aged 72, despite the threat of total collapse in the world's economy and their own discomfort. Let it not be said that I am indifferent to the arms trade that enslaves the world, manufactures war for the tools of war to be sold as foundation for Western wealth, our comforts, our freedoms, our cutting edge science, our democracy and hypocrisy. Let it be said that I am indifferent, indifferent to any consequence of the end of war and the arms trade. I despise them wholly when compared with the widespread outraged demand for justice by humans among us. Let it be said through our knowledge economy, <clears throat> the network consciousness of our species, our collective conscience, our international intolerance of money from debt. Let it be said, regardless of cost, cost to our lifestyle, of cost to our comfort, of cost to our trade, of cost to our cars, of cost to our pride, it shall be abolished, the arms trade, now, regardless of cost. Thank you.